Yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. I greet um, the, uh, the, the representatives of the, uh, the petitioners um, and the representatives of the uh, alleged victim. And I, I greet the delegation of the illustrious state of Argentina. And I declare open the public hearing of case 13.599. Ariel Osvaldo Mula versus Argentina. Please forgive me if I have mispronounced any, any names. My name is Margaret May McCauley, president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And I am on, um, I am accompanied today with on this hearing by Commissioner Julissa Mantilla, Rapporteur for Argentina and Commissioner Rofas Vice President, Esmeralda Arosemina de Troitino, and Commissioner Second Vice President, Roberta Clark, and Commissioner Joel Hernandez Garcia, and Commissioner Stuardo Rolon, and Commissioner Carlos Bernal Polido. Also present at this hearing is the Deputy Secretary for the Petition and Case System, Jorge Mesa. I give the floor to the Deputy Secretary, Jorge Mesa, to make a statement in relation to the instant case. Deputy Executive Secretary, please. Muchas gracias, señora Presidenta. Thank you very much, Madam President. This case is about the alleged responsibility of the state of Argentina on the alleged uh, violations to due process against Ariel Osvaldo Molar. This was part of a criminal case against him that led to a conviction of uh, life imprisonment. In 2018, the Commission notified the parties its decision to apply Article 36.3 of its rules in accordance to its Resolution 116 to uh, consider the admissibility to the merits of the issue. This hearing aims at receiving the declarations of the alleged victims and an expert witness and learn more about the allegations for admissibility and merits. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Executive Secretary. Um, first, the commission will hear the statement of the alleged victim, Ariel Oswaldo Mula, who is offered by the petitioners and who will testify, uh, who will relate the, the facts of this case. The petitioners will have up to 10 minutes to carry out their interrogatory of their uh, uh, um, victim. And subsequently, the state may also inter interrogate the alleged victim for up to 10 minutes. Finally, the commission will go on and ask questions of him. So, Mr. Mula, please tell us your full name, the place at which you were born, and your place of residence. Señora Presidenta, con su venia me permito traducir. Madam la... President, if I may, I will translate to the alleged victim. But the translators uh, are here. Yes, but he can hear me, remember. Oh. Please tell us your full name and your place of birth and residence. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Ariel Osvaldo Mojar. I was born on August 19th, 1977. I am Argentine, an Argentine citizen. Place of residence? Place of residence? May, Madam President, uh, he is asking, she is asking where uh, the, your place of residence. I am currently deprived of my liberty. So, I, yeah, but I live in La Plata, Argentina. Um, I give the floor to now to the petitioners so that they can carry out their questioning of the alleged victim. You have 10 minutes. Please commence. And please keep your eye on the clock sure that you keep within the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, commissioners. 
My name is Roman De Antoni. I am an attorney from the uh, office of the public of the um, of the defense of the people in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Mr. Moyar, could you please tell us briefly the the facts by that led to your conviction? What was your participation? Yes, first of all, I would like to greet the madam, uh, the president of this honorable commission, uh, the commissioners. I would also like to greet the representatives of the state of Argentina and the um, and everyone here at this hearing. With regards to the question, on January 13th, 2006, along with other people, I participated in the theft of a vehicle, a van. After perpetrating the theft, we were intercepted by a police car, which started to shoot at us while we were uh, fleeing with the uh, stolen van. We were 50 meters uh, beyond the police car. Two of us got out, got off the van and part of the group that was with me had a shootout with the police. I fled to the opposite side. I was running and shooting out in the open air. Out of that shootout that I didn't participate in, unfortunately, a public official was uh, dead and another one was injured. Now, it is technically and scientifically proven that the gun I was using did not provoke the death of the public official, nor the injury of the other public official. The bullet was not compatible with the weapon I had. I now, I do take responsibility because I was an active participant in the theft of a van, but I did not commit a homicide, nor did I hurt anyone. Of course, I am deeply sorry about what happened, the death of a person, the injury of another, but I didn't kill or injure anyone. Thank you, Mr. Moyar. How long have you been deprived of your liberty? Could you tell us about uh, your evolution during the time in prison? Have you taken, have you studied or taken professional trainings? If you had, has this been considered by uh, judicial authorities when assessing the possibility of giving you some, giving you some sort of benefits? Currently, I have been detained for 17 years and six months uninterruptedly. I am a primary president because I didn't have a criminal history. And in this time I've been detained, I have been through 11 prison centers. And ever since I got to a prison unit, from the first moment I got there, I studied, I trained myself, I finished my secondary studies I took several training courses, uh, professional training courses. Right now, I am uh, studying for two university degrees. I'm studying law. I have passed 22 subjects already, and I'm also studying to become a journalist. And I have passed 19 subjects for that course of study, studies. And from the very first moment, I also worked. Now, with regards to the recognition of my evolution, my evolution was never recognized. My studies, my uh, university studies were never recognized. Whenever I requested, uh, for example, transitory um, releases, uh, to be able to leave the uh, prison for a little moment, that was denied to me. And that lack of recognition came from the responsible judge 
and from the uh, Chamber of Appeals as well. And they never recognized any sort of petition with regards to my evolution. Mr. Moyar, could you please tell us if during the time you've been detained, have you received attacks that have affected your personal integrity? If so, please tell us about the consequences of that. Yes, sir. In 2015, on January 19, I suffered an attack against my life. I was stabbed in my chest. That stab touched a main artery that goes to the heart. And because of that attack, I had to go to surgery. I was in coma for 32 days. I received a tracheotomy in my throat. And throughout those 32 days, I suffered three heart attacks. Right now, I have heart disease because of that uh, urgent intervention. Uh, because they detected a cardiopathy while they were uh, operating me. And I want to say something else. I think it's very important to say that months before this attempt against my life, the authorities of the prison center I was in, that I was in the university ward, disarticulated that ward we were part of, that ward was a university ward. And as I mentioned, the authorities disarticulated it because they said that the prison center was overcrowded. So they allowed for the entrance of 35 to 40 persons to that pavilion or ward. And they broke. They uh, denaturalized everyone. They broke them. Mr. Moyer, could you please tell us about the impact of the life sentence to your family life? Yes. I would like to tell you about my family. I have a mother, a beautiful 21-year-old daughter, a brother, and a nephew. I haven't seen my daughter in 17 years and a half. I was never able, never able to see her again or hug her. My daughter barely remembers me. Unfortunately for her, I'm a stranger. I haven't seen my mother and my brother in five years. I can, I have spoken to them over the phone, thank goodness. My mother is an older person and it's very difficult for her to come to a prison. Of course, uh, this is very tough on her. They miss me every day. I miss them. And honestly, it's a constant, it's constant suffering and emptiness for all of us. Finally, Mr. Moyar, could you please tell us how if you if you could how would how does this conviction impact on your life project? Well, a life conviction takes everything from you. You have no objectives. It's very difficult to project a future, knowing that that future will never come. The effort, the sacrifice that you do, I, as I mentioned, take studying uh, for two college uh, course of studies. I'm about to become a lawyer, but it will be in vain. So I live in constant uncertainty. I don't know when I'm going to be able to leave. The uncertainty of these types of convictions is deteriorating for your mind and your body. It's constant deterioration. I will also like to say that uh, such an extensive conviction Uh, cuts you off from ev every affectionate uh, 
relationship you've had. It's very difficult to sustain them. You feel like you are dead. And I feel it's very unfair for a person not to give not to be given another chance. To sum up, I would like to say that I really want to live, to do things as they are meant to be done. I just ask for a chance, just a chance. That's what I ask for. Thank you. We have no more questions. Thank you. Um, I now invite the state uh, representatives to put, put their questions to the alleged victim. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Buenas tardes a todos y todas. El Estado agradece la. Thank you, Madam President. The state doesn't have any questions at the moment for the victim and appreciates uh, his statement. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I I then invite the members of the commission in this order to put their questions. We have a total of 15 minutes. I'm sorry, we have heavy rainfall. Um, Commissioner Country Rapporteur Julissa Mantilla, please. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Eh, buenas tardes, señor Moyar. Thank so you, much. Madam President. Good afternoon, Mr. Moyar. I will ask you some questions and you answer them. First of all, you told us about that attack that had consequences. Has there been any investigation regarding the persons who attacked you? Hello, Commissioner. There was an investigation and I know about this. When I'm discharged from hospital, I regain consciousness after being 30 days hospitalized in coma. When I recover consciousness, I remember this, that they came in to, so that I could give my statement, an official of the penitentiary system of Buenos Aires, to ask me about the events and ask me what I remembered about what happened. Also, I have to say that I had posted, I have filed against the state a complaint regarding these events. This was dealt by the office of the attorney general that's okay and after this attack the prison did they take any measures uh, to protect you to avoid this from happening again any specific measures i don't know madam because after that attack they took me to the regional hospital I had a surgery, I spent uh, several days in coma, and after 32 days, the same day I woke up, I regained consciousness, I opened my eyes. That same day at 12 at night, I was discharged and they took me to the penitentiary center in La Plata. It is good to know this because I couldn't walk. I was 32 days like this, so I couldn't stand up. I didn't have any force. I had to learn how to speak, how to walk. I couldn't go to the bathroom. I had all the injuries. Uh, open injuries and whether they had taken measures, I don't know about that because I didn't go back to that same unit where the attack was made. And before giving the floor to my colleagues, you have mentioned what life imprisonment means. You have continued studied and you want to keep on living. That is very important. If the commission 
was able to identify human rights violations, the state would have to provide reparations. So how would you feel repaired after everything that has happened? How do you imagine that a comprehensive reparation? First of all, I would like to thank the participation and the presence of the state. That is very important. I really appreciate that. At this moment, honestly, what I want is to have a logic limit for my sentence. I don't know when I'm leaving. I don't want to get into technical aspects because there's a technical expert that will talk about this. As a reparation, I want to know a proportional number of days the expert witness will deal with this, but I want to know how much time I have to do to, to serve my sentence. Thank you. Mr. Moyard, I have no further questions, Madam President. Thank you. I now invite the first vice president um, to uh, put forward her questions. Gracias, Presidenta. Un saludo al señor Ariel Osvaldo. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet the representative of Mr. Moyer Osvaldo, Mr. Moyer Osvaldo, and the representatives of the Argentinian state. Listening to your statement makes puts me in a position of questioning the effectiveness of a life imprisonment because what's the future, what's the purpose, you may think about, but in spite of this, you, during your time in confinement, you have find a way of improving your life by studying. I wanted to ask you if when you decided to study and made progress thanks to that, did you have the opportunity to talk, to discuss something with the judicial authority that decides the sentence? You have mentioned that the formula you have found so that your time in prison has some kind of effect, some kind of contribution in spite of the fact that you cannot think about the future. Have you been able to discuss this with the judge deciding, hearing the case regarding these spaces for personal improvement when someone is deprived of liberty. I would like to highlight that I was sentenced in 2012 when someone is convicted, there's a, a execution stage and a judge hearing. And since then, I had the opportunity to talk to her twice. I'm sorry, once, because the second time I spoke to another official, when I talked to Madam Judge, to her honor, I feel that she was making fun of me. I had a hearing when I requested re a release permit. And before deciding, I had a virtual hearing with her. And she said, Moshar, you are complying. I talked to her about progressiveness, about the academic evolution, about my behavior. 
there are reports that have been in my favor. These reports recommended this release permit to be granted, but her decision was negative. She said, you can access your release permit, but then in the practice in her decision, with her criteria, which I respect, determined the opposite. In the second hearing, I thought that I was going to meet her honor. I wanted to go to the National University of La Plata. I wanted to have a permit to complete my studies. And in that opportunity, we had a virtual hearing meeting with uh, the attorney that works with the judge. And to conclude, as I said before, I will continue, I will graduate, I will show everyone that it is possible to move on because I believe in God, because I have a beautiful family, because I have a daughter that I miss with all my soul and I will try to be an example for everyone if God allows me to that it is possible to set an example with responsibility a person can always improve and can always regret what he has done if they have committed a mistake or a crime thank you Mr. Ariel, that it's all on my part, Thank Madam you. President. Thank you. I now invite um, second Vice President Roberta Clark to put all her questions to the alleged victim. Yes, please. Thank you very much, um, President McCauley, and good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon to Mr. Moya. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, Jorge, you're doing the translation. Yes, I want to be sure that Mr. Moya hears me. Um, so Mr. Moya, I've listened. The purpose, and I, I want to also thank Commissioner Arosemina for speaking about the purpose of incarceration. And it seems to me, generally speaking, the purpose of incarceration is to allow the person who has committed a crime to take some accountability, to do some self-reflection, to allow, uh, certainly there's a deterrent aspect to imprisonment. And then, and then also to allow the person uh, opportunity for rehabilitation. And I, I've listened closely to you, Mr. Moya, and it seems to me, and I want to say I applaud your efforts at self-improvement. You've done quite a lot to, to increase your knowledge of the world. And I also applaud your acceptance of your accountability in relation to the um, the, the, criminal, the, act, the criminal activity that took place back when you were arrested. So here are some two questions I want to ask, and maybe it's for you and maybe it's for your expert. But first of all, I, I want to have a sense, how old were you when, this, uh, when you were arrested? I just want to have a sense of, of how, how old you were because you've already, I think you've been in prison for 13 years already. So that's the first question. Um, in relation to the person who stabbed you, um, was that person ever charged and prosecuted? And were you, I think that Commissioner Manti has asked you about whether or not you received reparations for that. And then the third question I have, maybe for us, for your representative, apart from your appeals and apart from this petition, are there mechanisms for getting a pardon from the state? Well, these are my questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. I will translate what Madam Vice President Clark has said. Commissioner has thanked uh, Madam Vice President Arosemena for recalling the, uh, reminding the goal of 
uh, any sentence to allow for rehabilitation in prison. She would like to acknowledge your effort for improving and for the effort regarding the accountability and acceptance of the crimes committed. She would like to know how old you were when you were arrested. This is important because she would like to know whether you have been in prison for 13 years. And secondly, she asked regarding the person that stabbed you, whether that person was punished. And she also reminded the importance of the question asked by Commissioner Mantilla regarding reparation, whether uh, you could like to add further information about that. And Madam Vice President also li would like to ask a question to the representatives of the petitioner, uh, and that will be done afterwards. When I was detained, arrested, I was 28. I'm afraid I must bring to your attention that um, our time only has 17 seconds of left. Um, can the answer be given in writing? And the rest of the questioning do what you have to tell me because it's commissioners who are left. Uh, three commissioners are left. Do you wish to, to have the time extended? Not you, uh, um, Representative. Uh, <laughs> Madam President, we believe that as the state didn't use their time, whether we can use the time so that uh, Mr. Moyar can add for the information to his yeah. statement. Yes, that's an affecting thing, but he he must try to be concise to, you know, shorten, shorten his answers, but say the facts. Please proceed. Could you start the clock and put the time up? Tiene que eh, abrir el micrófono, señor Ariel. Abrir el micrófono. You have to open your microphone. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't have uh, any subtitles, so I didn't know that I had to speak. I'm sorry. When I was arrested, I was 28. And today, I am about to turn 46. As I have highlighted before regarding my criminal record, this is the first time, the first crime for which I have been convicted. I was 28 when I was arrested. The question about the attack that I suffered, I don't know who did it, I don't remember. I, it was in 2016, but I didn't see who stopped me, and I don't know whether the responsible person has been found. I don't know. Presidenta, ya terminó el, el, el... Madam President, he has concluded. The declarant has concluded. Thank you very much. Um, I now invite Commissioner Joel Hernandez to put his questions. I just want to send my regards to Mr. Ariel Osvaldo and acknowledge the presence of the representatives and the representatives of the state. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Strado Rallon, please intervene now. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to ask whether as a result of the attack and the consequences to his health on his daily life, how is it for him to access 
medical treatment, whether he's following any treatment, how uh, this attention is provided in the prison where he is detained. Can I answer? Yes. In the unit in which I am, there is a sector with a cardiologist that comes once or twice a week. I can go there and see him, but the equipment that he has within this unit is very basic. When I have to, when I need studies that are more complex, I had to go to other hospitals. When I have to go through an echo Doppler or an echocardiogram that is more complex. I mean, when I have to be assessed, we have to request for the PEMI to the regional hospital and I get the appointment at that hospital. The last studies that were made to me because of my heart condition were made four years ago. Yes. Um, that's the answer. That's thank you very much. I now invite um, Commissioner Carlos Bernal to put on his questions to the alleged victim. Thank you, Madam President. Since there's no much time, I won't ask any questions. Thank you. Um, I I. It's, it could, I could put some questions now, but I prefer to hear the expert evidence. I think my questions will relate more to the expert. So we will move on to that now. But I do wish to, to um, thank um, Ms., Mr. Mueller um, for his evidence and, and thank you for being here and giving your evidence so clearly. I trust that the stab wound will not give you any future trouble um, with your health. Um, now, uh, the Commission will now hear the evidence of the expert, Gabriel Ignacio Anitois, um, offered by the petitioners. And the expert will testify about the characteristics of the life sentence in Antigua. Uh, Argentina, um, its current status and its compatibility with the in, um, American Convention. The petitioners have up to 10 minutes to do their quest, put their questions to the expert. Subsequently, the state may question the expert for up to 10 minutes as well. Finally, the commission will, commissioners will then ask their questions. Um, the expert, I am now addressing you, um, Mr. Anitra. Um, please indicate your full name, place of birth, and place of residence. Good afternoon. My name is Gabriel Ignacio Anitua. I was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and I currently live in Buenos Aires, Argentina as well. Um, um, uh, Mr. Expert Witness, do you swear or promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth to this hearing of this case? Yes, I do. I swear. Thank you. Um, I give the floor to the petitioner so that they can put their questions to their expert witness. Please proceed. Thank you very much, Madam President. 
Mr. Expert, what are the specific characteristics of the regulation of life sentence in Argentina and what's its impact in quantitative terms? Good afternoon, sir. The criminal code in Argentina dates back to 1921. It's the person who drafted it was a conservative politician and attorney who was later a governor of the province of Buenos Aires, uh, conceived of a system that was quite coherent, but this life sentence that was enshrined wasn't really a life sentence. The uh, system was related to the um, conditional freedom parole. And after a certain amount of years, there would be a parole, a surveilled freedom. And after five years, the uh, freedom would be granted. The life sentence would be finalized. It was called a life sentence, but it was actually indetermined. This was totally modified in the past 20 years. It was modified, but there wasn't any changes in the code. There were projects to renew the code, but uh, actually the only thing that there were were the reforms. There were two types of reforms. On the one hand, the amount of crimes that uh, could lead to a life prison uh, was expanded. There weren't many in 1921 and up to 2000, there weren't many as well, either uh, maybe aggravated murder, uh, betraying one's country. But in the past 20 years, many other types of crimes uh, were added. Um, aggravated homicide, homicides against police officers. That was in 2002, 2004, 2008. But also in 2004 and then in 2017, there was a transformation of the whole system. On the first, in the first place, Article 13 of the Criminal Code uh, sa stated that uh, there would be 35 years of prison and then 10 years of parole. But that was uh, repealed afterwards because of Article 14 of the Criminal Code, a large amount of uh, crimes were deprived from the possibility of parole. First of all, uh, those who had, uh, who, uh, had committed crimes before but then other cases were added. So almost all the behaviors were uh, included to that prohibition of accessing parole. All the um, qualified uh, homicide crimes, but also all those that led, that lead to uh, death, uh, kidnapping and a death or theft and death. But the truth is that all of those uh, types of behavior that lead to a life sentence do not admit any way to review the conviction or to access parole or, or a finalization of the conviction. And so uh, life sentences in Argentina are really life sentences, literally life sentences. And this is very serious. You have listened to the petitioner, but it's also serious in structural terms. You were asking about quantitative terms, the number. There has been a rise in the amount of persons convicted for life who have no possible future of uh, being freed. This is observed in several types of numbers. We have requested from the province of Buenos Aires the uh, records of the judiciary of those persons who have received a life conviction. And there are two things here. First, we've seen a rise in the amount of cases after 2004, in particular in 2016, 2017. And today, the number is 1,200 and 89 persons in the province of Buenos Aires with a real literal life sentence. At a national level, the figures are from December 2021 are 2,489. The dates we have from the province of Buenos Aires are from June 2023. There are, they are more updated. Now, this is a structural problem because of how the rights are affected, but also the other people who are affected by this. We're talking about 5% of the criminal population in um, 
in, in the province of Buenos Aires, the persons who are imprisoned. And this was seen in during the pandemic. The, the, the prisons were overcrowded. These are people coming in that never leave. They are very young when they go to prison and they will never live. And this, of course, affects the uh, rights affected by um, the um, by the by the conviction, but also the right to health, to work. I'm sorry, but the expert witness seems to be frozen. Yes, he is frozen. Oh, there he is. I apologize. I'm. I will be using this other account if it's possible. I think there was a problem with my network, as I was saying. This is a problem for the state in terms of the administration of these resources. It's scarce resources. And there are people who are going to jail and who will stay in prison until they are very old. Prisons are not prepared for older persons with the needs older persons have. These persons have to die in prison in accordance to the legislation. And this will be a problem for them, but also, but also for the entire state. Mr. P Expert, do you believe that... Uh, pre the prison, uh, this type of prison conviction, is it compatible with the American Convention? And do you believe the limit, the limit for the review of 35 years is compatible with the Convention? Life sentence has clear issues uh, with regards to the uh, right to, uh, to, to foresee your life, to have a project and cruel penalties, but the Inter-American Court uh, maybe in the case Mendoza has pointed out that it could be compatible with the principles. I don't see it. I believe there are issues here with the end in definition. That was the name of the uh, of the sentence. Uh, it was it used to be called indefinite uh, conviction. So uh, there are issues of proportionality of culpability because. Um, uh, there are also factors outside the control of the person being detained. Of, but as I said, the Argentine court, because I said this affects the convention, but also our constitution, the court stated that it, if it's not a life sentence, a, really li a real life sentence, then it is compatible. And we should take into account what the uh, European Court for Human Rights has said as well with regards to life sentence that can be reviewed if the, because if it affects, um, because I'm thinking of uh, a, a large amount of rulings linked to a possible revision or review. But there must be uh, a specific type of review. The limit of 35 years you mentioned, which is enshrined in the um, uh, in our law, that has issues as well. That long period, 35 years, and it's 35 plus 10, actually. So it's impossible to meet that term, right? But also the lack of clarity, the... Um, precept of who will be doing that review, what are the requirements to exert the defense, which ways are there to ask for an appeal. The way it is drafted right now, there are severe issues in terms of conventionality. And what should you should the requirements be for a life prison conviction that's reviewable to be compatible with the convention? Well, let me go back to the criteria of other countries, even in Latin America, that don't have a legislation as strict as Argentina's. Uh, as I was saying, for example, the um, legislation in Europe, there is a standard there and the limit of 35 years would be considered excessive there. The limit, I think, is 15 years for the possibility to have a review. And we could say, because of the rulings, that the limit is 25 years for the review. And these would agree partially with the principles of legality that uh, stem from the Rome Statute. Uh, because they are made for genocide and different crimes. But even in that case, we see the possibility to review the life sentence. 
in that limit of 25 years. That statute was incorporated to the Argentine legislation and uh, could provide uh, for grounds for interpretation as well. But I'm talking about the criteria to see if it's legal. So it's not just a possibility uh, to use this with jurisprudence because that would lead to inequalities, of course. So there should be an, a clear action known by those convicted so that they know what they have to do to get to that review so that there is certainty and clarity that derives from the principle of legality. Um, are you finished or do you wish to request more time? I have eh, one favor. more question, if I may. I would like to use that time. Mr. Expert. Well, how much time are you requesting? Two more minutes, just to finalize the point of this question. Statement. Fine, please go on. Thank you very much. In accordance to what you know, as far as you know, what is the majority legal criteria in Argentina, in particular the Supreme Court, with regards to the... Um, uh, the idea that there's it, the, the conviction, the life conviction is not constitutional. Well, there's a problem here because the Supreme Court has some jurisprudence with regards to the previous interpretative system that said that this indefinite uh, conviction did not, uh, was not against the constitution. But there are some issues here because after those legal reforms, it is believed that the criteria remains the same. There was a recent ruling, Alvarez from 2019, that I think that the commission reviewed it as well. It's a, technically, it's a bad ruling. In that case, there was a request to replace that indefinite uh, crime um, conviction to a conviction of 25 and they were asking for 30 years but the court issued a, a, a very strange ruling using previous jurisprudence saying that the uh, conviction was conventional because it was in the, uh, indetermined but it did not say that article 14 was inconstitutional so there are some issues there but we might say that it would adopt that hypothesis but there's another problem here because it allows all the lower courts to adopt different types of criteria there was uh, a judge that said that the uh, life sentence was inconstitutional and proposed a fixed conviction uh, system and then other judges other courts without saying it was unconstitutional, said that it was, went back to the idea of the uh, of the indefinity, uh, the, the, of the idea of uh, the, um, of the, of the conviction being indefinite. But the truth is that it would seem that they are all delaying the issue. They are postponing the issue. They are saying, well, right now, the moment we are establishing this conviction, we won't say anything. Maybe further ahead in 35 years, or they don't even say when, further ahead in the future, present your request. And then we will see if Article 14 is constitutional or not, if it agrees with our constitution or not. So they don't make the decision at the moment. And I think that's the worst resolution. Disculpe. <laughs> Thank you. You you have exceeded your time. I have to give that time to the state. I now um, invite the state to um, question the the expert witness, and you have two and a half minutes extra. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I would just like to thank the expert witness. Uh, the state will not be asking questions. Thank you. The state will not be asking questions. Thank you. Oh, I beg your pardon. My finger went the wrong way as well. I do thank the state. 
for, for um, saying that they do not wish to intervene with questions. And I invite the country rapporteur, Commissioner Mantira, to put her questions to the expert witness. Thank you very much, Madam President. Good afternoon, Mr. Anitua. Thank you so much for being here because you've provided much information on compared Um, the issue of life imprisonment, because it's not about uh, the deprivation of liberty, because it deprives you from a life project. It's two things. The and prison has a different objective. So thank you so much for your presentation. I only have one question with regards to the prison benefits. Mr. Moyar was telling us everything he's done, but no uh, exits were uh, granted to him. So in accordance to your experience, could uh, prison benefits be asked for Mr. Moyar? And would that mean a reduction of his conviction? Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner. Yes, um, what the Inter-American Court has discussed the uh, life project issue in the Mendoza case as well. And it's linked to uh, minors, but it could also be applied, of course, to adults. The problem you're mentioning is that these benefits um, if, are not foreseen by the law. There are no possibilities there. It would be very different if we analyze jurisprudence, what happens in practice, and that will depend on the individual judge and what will happen at the appeal courts as well, or the Supreme Court that only, our Supreme Court only has four members uh, right now, so uh, its credibility is not the best. But the truth is that it's not generating jurisprudence that can be interpreted. So it's very arbitrary. Some judge may allow, because of the educational experience, consider some sort of possibility for an exit, but others won't. And that is also a problem that clearly affects the American Convention. No further questions, Madam President. Thank you. Now invite my um, sister Esmeralda, first vice president, to put her questions to the experts. Bueno, muchas gracias por sus sus Thank you for all the information. They're very technical, very important. Taking into account the question asked by Commissioner Mantilla and your presentation, when I listen to you, I think how many legislative reforms or norms does this legal type require in Argentina? As the Commission, in this particular case, if it were determined that there is a violation and finding ways so that the state does not repeat these events, what reforms should be made? How could you start making these reforms? Take into account the decision that the commission may make. Thank you, Commissioner. The state, because the thing is that they're waiting, they're waiting for someone to organize this problem that has been caused by bureaucracies 
this leads to problems, particularly for the penitentiary system, the different provinces don't know how to get out of this problem. To start with, we should declare the inconstitutionality of the Article 14 that breaks with that system that existed in the 1921, uh, the Code of 1921. Article 13 should also be replaced by some kind of system that allows for the review well, that respects that convention. First of all, that it reduces that 35 year limit, uh, but that it regulates, provides clarity to the judges, to the persons convicted regarding what they have to do to go over that review so that life imprisonment ends. That can be done at the level of the jurisdiction. The best thing could be to do a legal reform. Maybe that implies uh, having a new criminal code. If we go back to the code of 1921, well, many things uh, are um, de described well in that code. Thank you. That's all, Madam President. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I now um, invite, uh, I think it's second vice president, uh, Roberta yes. Clark. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very quickly because I suppose other commissioners want to ask questions to two things. The first question uh, to the expert. Are there possibilities for seeking a pardon so outside of the legal process, the legal appeals, and the challenges to the constitutionality of these laws? Is there also the possibility of seeking um, a pardon? And are those processes judicially reviewable? That's the first question. Secondly, um, it seems to me that if you can only get a review, after a 35 year mark, in essence, that seems like a mandatory death penalty, death, death, mandatory life, life imprisonment. Um, and one might say that that offends the separation of powers because it removes the judicial discretion for sentencing. Yeah, right. Has this um, been considered in the, in the cases in for the courts? Thank you. Thank you. The possibility, the executive power has in the case of the national or provincial uh, executive power can give pardon, and that could be a good solution at an individual level. In the individual case, that may be a solution. For Mr. Mojar, that would be the solution, but not for the others uh, inmates, because this is a structural problem. There are many persons in this situation. There is a situation of proportionality related to your second question. There are cases in which the life imprisonment is mandatory and is a lack of proportion of balance regarding the other persons that participated in the same uh, criminal offense. Or, for example, genocide is life imprisonment. Participated in the robbery where someone died, that is life imprisonment. So there's a lack of proportionality. And reviewing these, that could imply uh, modifying the criminal code. Um, um, second Vice President, I, you seem to say from your body movement that you finished. I mean, the question I was asking, but we, we don't have to get into it, whether or not the, the removal of judicial discretion and sentencing, does that amount to a violation of separation of powers? But we can, you know, can take that under advisement and writing. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I now um, call, um, invite uh, Commissioner uh, Carlos Bernal to place his questions um, to the witness, expert witness. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. This statement is very interesting. I'd like to ask him whether he can clarify something regarding the inconstitutionality of this article in the code. 
I could like to know from the position of the petitioner, what are internal uh, instruments that he may use to appeal his case, in particular, the remedies or constitutional actions. Thank you. In Argentina, we have a system. There's no specific constitutional court. Every judge can assess the constitutionality of a norm. And I understand that during the uh, process, I don't know the case, but maybe this has been stated in during the first instance or before the Supreme Court of the province. They have discussed the constitutionality of this article and probably he didn't have any uh, positive results and he has exhausted all the instances offered by the country. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Um, I, I I must apologize to my brother, Commissioner Joel Hernandez, who I skipped um, completely until now. Clearly, it is because implicit in that is that the last shall be the best. <laughs> Gracias, Presidenta. Lo dudo porque ya aquí. Thank you, Madam President. I doubt it because the my colleagues have asked all relevant questions, but I have a question for Mr. Anitua, and I don't know whether this exceeds his knowledge or expertise regarding legislative reforms. Something Commissioner Arosmena mentioned. I would like to know whether this life imprisonment issue is being discussed publicly, maybe between uh, bars or in the academic world. Thank you. I believe that in the academia, yes. Not only the legal problem, but also sociological problem. There are more and more people in this situation in the future. These percentages will continue to increase. This is a structural problem, as I have said before. At a political level, this is used, uh, but there's no concern. There's a logic of magic. Victims are not asking for justice. They are asking for life imprisonment. If it's not life imprisonment, there's no justice for my relative. And this is a problem, in, not only for an academic debate, but a social debate. And this is a problem for the political class in general. I don't have any proof, but I have any doubts that politicians are waiting for someone to order them to organize this situation in Argentina. Outside the debate in the media, this is a very high cost for the political class to go against life imprisonment or to set limits. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just very quickly um, uh, would ask this. Um, this is um, it tied up somewhat with what uh, Commissioner Howell has said. Has it been discussed that in fact a life imprisonment, which you say is real life, that is, if they live to be a hundred and two, they're there until they're a hundred and two. This is a living death. It's 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 it really is a, a living death. Worse than. Capital punishment, I should think, if you balance the two um, um, to live in those circumstances, then no, you can never get out. And, and I tie up with this with what my brother um, um, Hoel has asked. Has this, has this been tested in the public? Does the, and the majority of the population in Argentina want people to be in, in situations of living death? And do they realize the cost to them in taxes and what it costs the revenue in revenue to have these people in prison? I've always wondered why there's a problem of overcrowding in prisons in Latin America. Isn't this one of the problems? Too many people leave there for years and years to die. 
it doesn't I, I'm I'm from the common law system it doesn't make sense to me at all and and have you have you tried public debate in in Argentina are you going to try it do you need assistance technical assistance from the commission in order to do that it doesn't make sense and no government has ever brought this out I've asked you several questions. You you can't you cannot answer them now. I hope you will give us a written note, because it's an amazingly incomprehensible problem to me, and and I have trespassed on time. So please, if you can give us a note, a short note, I I, I really cannot understand it. Thank you. I I um now. We come to the presentations of arguments by the parties, and the petitioners will have 15 minutes um, to present um, their arguments. And then the state will also have 15 minutes to present its arguments. And subsequently, if the petitioners so wish, they will have a further five minutes to exercise their right of reply, and the state will have five minutes to exercise their right to rejoin them. Finally, the commission may again ask questions of the parties if they so wish. I now give the floor to the petitioners so that they can make their oral presentations. You have 15 minutes to do so. Bueno, muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Thank you, Madam President, commissioners. In this hearing, you have heard two statements that show the seriousness of the situation faced by Mr. Ariel Osvaldo Moshar, taking into account the life imprisonment and the legislation in Argentina. As the expert has pointed out, this case is not an isolated case, but it represents a growing number of persons detained that have been convicted to life imprisonment without any chance, as the expert witness has stated of recovering their freedom. This situation was caused by reforms in different laws in 2004 and reforms in 2017 that expanded the number of crimes that do not allow for uh, release permits. So every person that is convicted because of aggravated crimes, they are subject to life imprisonment that do not grant any kind of release uh, so that this sentence is for life. We believe this is a great opportunity so that through the participation of the organizations of, for protection, the commission can make a statement on this and the state can adapt in its internal regulations to international standards. The system of sanctions in the country is one of the cruelest in the region and in the planet as well. Commissioners take into account what has been stated in the hearing. We consider that these different events violate the uh, rules and the convention of the commission. For example, right to life. Article 80.7 of the criminal code and articles 165 create a vicious cycle. The article that has been applied in this case establishes life imprisonment, but the problem arises when we go to Article 13 of the criminal code in the general part, establishes a sentence, establishes that a person sentenced to life imprisonment can access release permits um, or parole after 35 years. But the problem is that Article 14, the following article, bans this possibility uh, for those persons convicted by Article 80. So the punishment established by Article 80 is for life. In that regard, we understand that right to life is not limited to biological protection, but as the expert has said, it has to do with the life project, quality of life, and this is taken into account 
the scope the court has given to this article. Damage to life project affects personal development opportunities, irreparable harm, and this has been materialized in Moshar's situation, which has turned uh, his punishment in um, degrading punishment. And when the possibility of having a review and uncertain and prolonged, there is also a violation. In the current system in our country, the possibility to apply release uh, permits because there there are few cases in which this has been applied. The limit of 35 years is makes this uh, punishment, in fact, for life. The time limits and the conditions to review life imprisonment cannot exceed what is established by international law for more serious crimes. As the expert has said, the Statute of Room that is incorporated to the Argentine legal system establishes a limit of 25 years for the most serious crimes for the international community. So the limit established for common crimes, uh, such as the one committed by Mr. Moyano, shouldn't be ex uh, the same or exceeding that limit. So there is a lack of protection of those values protected by the international law. On the other hand, the time limit for has to be known when the sentence is established so that the person convicted can know when that person can request for a review of the sentence. In Mojano's case, internal legislation impedes the um, parole. If he were to request this after 35 years, there is no warranty whether this review will be positive or not. There is great precedent of persons sentenced to life imprisonment in which the defense has established the inconstitutionality of Article 14 of the Criminal Code, and the courts don't even analyze it as they think it is premature. The Supreme Court of Buenos Aires has has a sentence that has been confirmed by the Supreme Court of Justice of our country. So the convicted can discuss whether the norm impeding the release is after 25 years. Article 14 does not allow him to have this possibility. Thus affects the uh, project of life turning the sentence into an arbitrary punishment. This violates the possibility to have any kind of rehabilitation and this affects the personal integrity and human dignity of Mr. Moshar. Mr. Moshar has proven that after 17 years of detention, he has made great effort towards his personal improvement. He has done two university careers and he's about to graduate. However, he says that all his efforts are useless because of the nature of the sentence, which diminishes the possibility or hope of being released. Thus, life imprisonment neutralizing the subject until the subject dies because the sentence ends when the person dies, violates the right of rehabilitation. In conclusion, life imprisonment affects right to life in Article 4, Article of Psychological Integrity 5.1, not going through inhuman uh, sentences, 5.6, and the right to resort to a competent judge to review his arbitrary detention. On the other hand, life imprisonment that is reviewed is not compatible with the convention if the limit is established at 35 years. So even if Article 14 is declared to be unconstitutional, the limit 
established in Article 13 also violates articles of the American Convention, as I have said before, as the Article 13 establishes a 35-year limit, it violates the Convention. If this is conventional, we believe that certain conditions have to be fulfilled. The review limit cannot be cannot exceed uh, that limit established for more serious crimes, 25 years, and the review uh, limit and the conditions to access liberty have to be known by the convicted since the sentence is made, so that he has a realistic expectation. He has to be have compliance with the norms he take into account the instruments provided by the state otherwise this is a mere illusion on the other hand we understand that the regulation of article 14 of the criminal code at the moment uh, the uh, crime was committed it violates the principle of equality access to uh, parole regarding persons convicted by uh, Article 80.7 are convicted with the same uh, punishment, but they have different criminal, criminal types. For example, one person convicted to life imprisonment because of Article 80.7, 80.3, or crimes that may be even more uh, serious can request parole, whereas a person convicting because of Article 80.7, such as Mr. Mouchard, didn't have that opportunity. So the reform that has been introduced in 2017 expanded the catalog of crimes that cannot access this benefit. It cannot be a violation of the principle of equality because of a norm that is um, posterior as it violates the principle of progressiveness. The imposition of life imprisonment violates the principle of uh, guilt uh, in Article 9 of the Convention. Article 80 of the Chemical Code establishes only life imprisonment without the possibility of allowing the judge here in the case graduating the circumstances of the events. In this case, it has been proven that Moshar, as he has said in his allegations, was not the person that uh, shot the gun that killed the policeman. But that participation was not reflected in the punishment when reviewing the criminal type. There is an automatic sentence. There's also a violation to the uh, principle of legality. Articles 80.7 and 165 of the Criminal Code typify the same um, behavior, which is killing in the event of a robbery. 165 establishes 10 to 25 years, but Article 80 establishes life imprisonment. According to jurisprudence, the, this in practice, any changes in the participation of the events, in practice, this is not taken into account by the judge. If there is a theft, the judge has to decide. Uh, he has two options to apply two different legal uh, norms. This then does not protect the principle of legality. Finally, Mr. Moshar has suffered a series of physical attacks that le led to heart failures and respiratory failures. These attacks have been documented and they have been presented before the commission. So we believe that the state has failed as it did not prevent these violent attacks in the penitentiary center but it did not investigate the attack either. So the judicial investigation about which the commissioner asked, this has been closed in 2022 without adopting any measures that led, that led to discovering the truth or identifying the uh, authors of, of the persons 
that caused this attack, they have not been investigated. That's why we believe that the state has violated resolution of the Inter-American Commission. Taking everything into account, the Cassation Court, as the representatives of Mr. Moshar request the commission to declare the responsibility of the state because of the violation of articles that have already been stated before of the American Convention in connection with articles 1.1 and 2 of the same instrument to the detriment of Mr. Moshar recommend the Argentine state as a non-repetition measure establishes legislative measures to adapt the internal um, legislation to inter international standards in connection with life imprisonment in order to make articles 13, 14, 80, and 165 of the criminal code with articles 4.1, 5.6, 9.24 of the convention. Finally, we request that the commission recommends the state to determine a review um, so that he is sentenced according to the degree of participation in the crime that he has committed. If the uh, conviction is of life imprisonment again, it should ask the um, state to allow for Mr. Moshar to uh, have a time limit established so that his uh, parole can be reviewed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I now invite um, the state delegation so that they can make their own um, oral presentation if they wish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, on behalf of the government of Argentina, I would like to thank uh, the petitioners for their presentation. The um, Secretariat of the uh, for Human Rights will be speaking. And now I will give the floor to the National Director of Legal Affairs of the Secretariat, Ms. Gabriela Clerksen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President. I would like to thank you for this space, and I would like to greet uh, your uh, commission, the other commissioners, and the executive secretary. I would also like to thank Mr. Mojar for his participation. I would like to uh, greet uh, Mr. De Antoni and the office he represents. This is a wonderful opportunity to recognize their work in the public defense of our country. It's also a wonderful opportunity. Uh, to listen to Mr. Anitua, who was also a wonderful official in the province of Buenos Aires. And um, we, Argentina has much to thank him for the defense in the, for his work in the defense of human rights. Now, with regards to this case, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, talk about the uh, uh, observations of the merits presented by the petitioner. On January 19, 2016, Mr. Mojar was stabbed in his chest while he was at the uh, ward number two of a prison center. He stayed in uh, the ICU uh, unit for over a month. He suffered three heart attacks. Mr. Mojar, uh, talked about the facts and repeated his experience. According to his clinical history shows a, a cardiopathy, uh, sorry, a heart disease as well. Now, some of the testimonies, according to some testimonies, another inmate was uh, guilty of the attack and uh, it is, uh, uh, and even though the authorities looked for the weapon, they could never find the weapon with which uh, he was attacked. The ward was closed for 15 days, and then all the persons in there were uh, interviewed. 28 persons gave testimony, but an administrative um, office within the same place where they were deprived of their freedom. Only one of them declared before the judicial authorities. The public prosecution 
tried to uh, subpoena other seven detainees. Now, these statements never took place. And in one case, the uh, I'm sorry, but it's difficult to understand them because of their audio. The public prosecution, sorry, even though could you speak a little bit louder? The interpreter is having a bit of a problem because of the audio. Perhaps if you could increase your volume. I will be near to the microphone. Now, if you much better, thank you. Yes. Should I begin again or should I go no, no, back no, to where just, I was? Just continue. Perfecto. La Fiscalía realizó alguna the public prosecution tried to subpoena other seven detainees by addressing the courts they had been uh, convicted by. Those statements, as I mentioned, never took place. In one case, the court that was in charge of the detainee had uh, summoned him, but the public prosecution let two years went by, go by and insisted on subpoenaing them when he had been released. And even though they obtained the telephone number and the address, the public prosecutor's prosecutor's office never contacted him again. The same occurred with the other persons who had been tried to be subpoenaed during 2020 and 2021, uh, they reported the domiciles, but the public prosecutor's office was not interested in summoning them to, uh, de to declare. And only three penitentiary agents declared or presented testimony. And all of them declared at the administrative office, not a court. So, in the proceedings of the penitentiary service, not the judiciary, none of them was subpoenaed by an actual court. All three agents, I'm sorry, all three agents said that the search they, uh, they did afterwards was unsuccessful and that none of them were uh, on the site when the attack took place. They said that they arrived at the place once the attack was over, and none of them said that they, who was there and who should have been there when the attack took place. After their uh, testimony, over a year after the facts, in August 2017, Mr. Moyar tried to file a lawsuit. The court rejected his request because his attorney did not include the invoice for his payment. The public prosecutor's office filed the proceeding in 2022. It said that the uh, evidence that was, uh, was insufficient to determine who were the material authors and said that no other evidence had been gathered. Madam President, commissioners, in these last few years, we have adopted the same position before this commission in cases as this one. There's a thorough duty of custody in charge of the state, which should protect the physical and mental uh, capacities of those deprived of their liberty. And, and, and it's, it has a duty to investigate the lesions against the uh, life or integrity of those deprived of their liberty. Now, the circumstances I've just revealed show that Mr. Moyar was not protected against the attack he suffered in January 2016. First, because it has been proved that a lethal weapon was in the hands of an inmate and he attacked another one within an institution and there was no personal uh, guard, there were no guards in the place where the, where the attack took place. Secondly, the criminal case shows a series of elements that show a lack of compatibility with due diligence. 
we should also point out that a uh, more importance was given to the administrative proceeding where only three uh, poli uh, penitentiary agents uh, gave their testimony. And the public prosecutor's office did not attempt to get a statement from the rest of the inmates. This would have been important if we considered what I mentioned, because everything was filed because they said it was impossible to gather more evidence. The victim was not allowed to file a lawsuit, even though he specifically requested this. Finally, we believe it's very important to add another element we've mentioned in other cases, like this one, that uh, discuss other investigations on persons deprived of their liberty. Uh, the lack of investigation that uh, try to protect security uh, guards in administrative and criminal institutions. So in no scenario was it even considered to point fingers at the responsibility of the constitutional and conventional uh, duty of protecting those deprived of their freedom. Ultimately, Madam President and commissioners, the state is at this hearing to recognize its international responsibility in this case for the violation of articles 5.2, 8.1, and 1.1 of the American Convention on Human Rights against Mr. Ariel Moyar. Our position adjusts to the jurisprudence of the inter-American system and is ex exposed in the Constitution of Argentina. Prisons should not be meant for punishment, and those deprived of their liberty are not deprived of the rest of their rights, in particular, the protection uh, of the law in equal terms. So we would also like to point out that the current administration of the province of Buenos Aires has implemented actions to realize its political commitment to those deprived of their liberty. And many of these actions, as the commission knows, were presented by the Minister of Justice and Human Rights of the province of Buenos Aires at the period of sessions that took place in Los Angeles, the US, a couple of months ago. Now I will discuss certain aspects with regards to the admissibility of this proceeding. We should point out that on June 12, 2018, the commission decided to defer the decision of admissibility to the report of Article 50 of uh, the American Convention. The commission believes that admissibility and the factual uh, framework should be defined when the report is filed. That is why we do not agree with what the petitioner is saying because the application of resolution 116 uh, should not include the um, factual framework and its admissibility. If the commission accepts this, what I mentioned about the attacks suffered by Mr. Moyar could not be addressed by the commission because they took place after the resolution 116 was issued. So now I will discuss the allegations of the state linked to the uh, life imprisonment sentence in 2008. In the uh, main aggravation presented here is based on the, the fact that the conviction against Mr. Moyar does not admit a life sentence as an exhaustion of the crime because Article 14 of our code does not allow that benefit in uh, Article 18. Now, this only appeared before the Supreme Court of Justice of the province of Buenos Aires. Before that, the remedies uh, against this conviction did not refer to this point. And the Supreme Court of Justice of Buenos Aires said that the matter of the constitutionality of uh, the conviction had not been discussed in the previous remedies and therefore was inadmissible. In the RICO case that presented a very uh, similar uh, supposition, the aggravation had not been introduced in a timely manner before the provincial court because it had not been discussed in the lower instances. In that case, the Inter-American Court accepted uh, the uh, remedy filed by the Argentine government because there was no exhaustion. The Inter-American Commission has also um, used this sort of criteria 
Según Even esta... when, with regards to the lack of exhaustion of internal domestic remedies, because there, that requirement cannot be met if the remedies were not, did not follow the uh, existing procedures. So the conventionality of Article, Article 14 of the Criminal Code and its application in aggravated homicide was not discussed domestically. That is why the Inter-American com, uh, Commission cannot consider that all remedies were exhausted. So to finalize, Madam President and Commissioners, we would like to thank the observations of Mr. Anitua and Mr. De Antoni with regards to a life sentence in Argentina. The punitive trend that has been reflected in the last 20 years is a matter of human rights. Nevertheless, the treatment of human rights affairs by the protection system is not exhausted in cases. The discussion on the penalties or convictions corresponds to the political community and the representative organs. So the work of promotion of the commission can be very pertinent because it would strengthen the public debate. Therefore, we understand that those um, functions of promotion are the best space where to discuss whether it should correspond to this um, it should correspond to reform the criminal code in Argentina in particular if we consider that Mr Moyer was convicted in 2008 and started to to serve his time before the new uh, reform of the code now the inter-american court states that it, no uh, ad orders for the adjustment of regulation sh uh, cannot be adequated or adjusted if uh, if they predate the fact. So commissioners, that is why we request, first of all, that the commission accepts the preliminary exception with regards to life sentence and abstains from uh, stating its position. Secondly, that it should accept the recognition of uh, international responsibility of the state against Mr. Mojar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the representative uh, delegate from the state. Um, I now um, um, ask the petitioners if, that you have five minutes uh, to, to state a reply, if you wish to do so. And following that, the state will have five minutes for a rejoinder if they wish to do so. So the state, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. First of all, I would like to thank uh, for the comments of the representatives of the state for the words they used. And I would like to also thank uh, Mr. Coriolano, who headed this office and was the uh, head of the presentation. Mr. Moyar did in 2012. Secondly, I would also like to under, uh, recognize the state because of their admission of the lack of judicial investigation after what took place at the penitentiary center. Nevertheless, this petitionary party does not agree with some of the arguments presented by the state. First of all, the state says that uh, the requests with regard to the incompatibility of the life sentence were um, extemporaneous. Now, I must say, first of all, that the court did not reject the request because it was extemporaneous. The federal court invoked Article 280 of the, uh, of the Civil Code of Argentina that allows to reject these matters for insufficiency, meaning what I'm trying to say here is that the court did not reject the request for because it was extemporaneous, as the state is saying. And I should also point out two things. There have been many cases where the Supreme Court discussed issues that were presented at the complaint before the federal court. 
And secondly, the federal court has a long jurisprudence, and when it considers that a request is extemporaneous, it rejects the, um, re the, the remedies. And that did not take place in this case. Also, the state says that according to the jurisprudence of the court that was developed in the ruling Rodriguez Pereira, which is the conse consecration of a long line of cases, the control should be done ex officio by any court in the country. So when there's an incompatibility with the convention, it's not necessary for the party uh, to mention it as soon as it can. The judge doesn't have a choice. It has a duty to declare ex officio that there's a lack of conventionality. And in this case, the defense, the particular defense of Mr. Moyar presented, filed an appeal remedy against these, uh, this conviction, this life conviction. And when it was refused, he filed an extraordinary remedy. So the state was fully aware of Moyar's situation after the claim at the commission linked to the incompatibility of life sentences and the constitution and the convention. So the state had a chance to remediate the situation, but did not try to do that. And we should also mention the admissibility record 2608 of the Mendoza case, where the commission considered that considering that the state is fully aware of the claims before the commission with regards to the convictions and the incompatibility of the life sentence with the constitution and the convention, uh, the um, com the commission considered that the uh, remedies had been exhausted, but then the organs of the systems, uh, the fact that the remedies need to be exhausted doesn't mean that the elite victims have to exhaust them. Both the courts and the commission have said that the rule with regards to the exhaustion of domestic remedies is for the entities of the state, uh, but uh, in this case, the uh, remedies were presented domestically. So if the elite victim filed the matter on the alternative uh, methods and the state had a possibility to remediate that, we believe that there has been an exhaustion. We believe that has happened. But also, uh, if we understood that the petitioner did not duly exhaust domestic rem remedies. And if it is considered that the state said that there was an extemporaneity, even with regards to the admissibility exam, since the facts did not change because the situation did not change throughout the process, the um, conviction, the life conviction remains there fixed. So just as the commission did in the case 13401, for Guillermo Alvarez, where it recognized the violation of the life conviction in the merits report, we understand that the commission can apply the same principle here, juris non vinculum. So the convention and the rules of the, com of the American convention prevent the commission to uh, address the facts that happened before the presentation. So we believe that the state should accept this petition and uh, accept the requests of uh, the petitioner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you're on mute, Madam President. I, I had it on when I looked away, my finger must have switched it off. I invite the states to, to proceed with their rejoinder, um, if they wish. Sí, muchas gracias. Solo para aclarar, eh, Thank you. We just want to clarify the reference that we made to the introduction of the constitutional uh, uh, matter. We're not doing it regarding the its discussion before the Supreme Court of Justice, it appears before the uh, Supreme Court of the province of Buenos Aires for the first time. We believe that 
the issue have been articulated the, the first time in the cassation stage and it appears for the first time before the Supreme Court of Buenos Aires. We understand the um, limit of time and I will now give the floor to my colleague. Good afternoon, commissioners. We can't hear what they are saying as they are very far from the microphone. Um, the, uh, the interpreters cannot hear you. I'm going to sit here then. Good afternoon, Madam President, Commissioners. Thank you. I just want to mention that this uh, lack of fulfillment of the remedy to appeal before the Supreme Court, the federal part was not presented regarding the constitutionality of life imprisonment. That was not mentioned in previous remedies that had been filed. That is something that should have been stated from the beginning of the case in connection with what Dr. Antoni has said regarding the exception regarding the exhaustion of uh, internal remedies. This is based on the principle of subsidiarity, which is translated in the petitions and cases system. The control of conventionality, this is something that is part of the inter-American system, which is very powerful, but it has not, it does not affect the exhaustion of internal remedies, which is a requisite uh, condition to make the request. If this were the case, this should be referred to the state and based on Article 46 of the American Convention, especially regarding the principle of subsidiarity, which is the foundation of the inter American system, we believe that that is something that is not appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now invite the commissioners to um, make their questions, but I see that we are have only five minutes left to the official closing time. And um, <laughs> Um, can you be as succinct as you can? And let's see uh, that we do not go over too much time. So yeah. I, I invite the com country rapporteur, my sister, Julissa. Thank you, Madam President. I'm going to be brief and maybe you can send your response in written. First of all, beyond the conventionality control, which is a construction. The question that I had, judges, shouldn't they have uh, assessed the sentence, whether that was compatible with the Inter-American Convention, whether that is compatible with the convention? That is the question. And for the petitioners, I have no questions. I just want to thank you, congratulate your participation. As country rapporteur, I have been able to work with you and um, believe that your presentation has been really good. And for Mr. Moyar, we appreciate your presence, your spirit. The commission has heard you and what you have said is important that you want to keep on living. Thank you. Um, my, my The first um, vice, pre first vice president, please make your intervention. <coughs> I'm not going to ask questions. I just want to uh, send my regards to Mr. Osvaldo and send him a message to continue with his spiritual and mental strength. 
and um, the second vice president, um, the uh, Commissioner Clark. Thank you. I have no uh, questions. I just want to thank the representatives of the state and the victim and his representatives for their participation today. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Joel Hernandez. Eh, no tengo preguntas. Gracias, I have no questions. Thank you, Madam President. And um, okay, I should have mentioned uh, Commissioner um, Rallon had to leave um, for unavoidable reasons. Uh, Commissioner Carlos Bernal. Presidenta, yo tampoco tengo preguntas. Madam President, I have no further questions. I would like to thank to the petitioners and the estate for this hearing, especially the estate for acknowledging the responsibility regarding the protection of the persons deprived of liberty and the need to investigate the perpetrators of the crime. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also have no, no uh, questions to put, um, except to say, to say Thank you to both parties um, for their um, submissions and, and uh, statements today, and particularly to the witnesses, um, Mr. Miola and, and Mr. Antigua, and Annie Twa, <laughs> um, the expert witness. Um, I, I, I do thank you all, and, and we have listened to you, and we are always ready to give technical support, which may be found necessary to assist any changes which could or should take place, because that will be a decision for the states and its citizens to make ultimately, but we can assist in doing promotional work in order for the issue to be fully art articulated and decisions to be made thereafter um, by a state. I must admit I'm on the state of, but that's my personal position as a common law lawyer <laughs> and not <laughs> anything. And I do wish you all the best with your health, Mr. Mueller, and that you will continue to excel in your studies um, in improving yourself, which seems to be that you've done a lot for your rehabilitation um, yourself. And that is very good and speaks to your strength of character. I do wish you all the best and I thank all of you. Could you please leave your cameras open so that the, our photographer can take his photographs for our records, please. Thank you so thank you so much, Madam President. It's just gonna take uh, one second. If everybody can look at the camera, I'll be really glad. Thank you so much. Hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. I thank thank you enormously for being here and the, the translators and those who are online who have witnessed the hearing. I thank the delegation of the illustrious state of Antigua and, and Argentina. I, Antigua keeps on coming to my head. Argentina. And to you, Mr. Mueller, and to the expert witness who was so clear in his evidence. I thank you so much, all of you and the rest of the state's delegations for your submissions. Thank you. Civil thank society. you. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. And don't, gracias, much, and don't work as much as we have to do tonight. Muchas gracias, señora Bye. Presidenta. Buenas tardes. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.